particular goal. That's more than fighting for your position. That's wanton destruction. I hope at least some House Republicans will come to see the difference between fighting for your goals and sowing anarchy in pursuit of them. Mr. President, uh, I note the actions of the court. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. And the Senate back in a quorum call now. Just to recap, the Senate and the House still deadlocked over funding the federal government. At midnight tonight, the fiscal year will end, and with it, many government services will end as well. Both chambers earlier today did pass bills to keep military pay in place in case of a shutdown, which, as Politico's reporting, is looking more likely since the House is working on a new funding bill with new attachments that the Senate says it will reject. And we also heard earlier today from President Obama, who's still urging Congress to come to some kind of an agreement and avoid a shutdown.
And in a quorum call on the Senate floor here, again, the Senate and the House still not able to come to an agreement over funding the federal government. And that funding runs out in less than six hours now. Over in the House trying to work on an alternate bill that the Senate say, has been saying all day that they will not pass. It would attach a delay in the health care laws individual mandate. And it would also attach another measure that would do away with subsidies for health care for Congress, staff, and those who work for the White House. Washington Post had an article today about the potential impact on the Washington, D.C. region in this area where, of course, capital is largest concentration of federal workers. The loss would be about $200 million a day and 700,000 jobs affected. Tourism in D.C., of course, the Smithsonian Museums will be closed, the National Zoo closed, and Civil War battlefields and other parks and historic sites will uh, not be open. An economist, Stephen Fuller, he's with George Mason University, he calls this serious. It's a national, that the national economy may not notice a shutdown much for several weeks, but that the Washington area, for them, it's a tsunami. We're going to take a look from earlier today. The Senate Democrats talked about the effect on women's health care, and here's what they had to say. We'll take a look at this while the Senate's in a quorum call. Good morning, everybody. I'm here with two great colleagues of mine, Senator Stabenow, Senator Hirono. We're here to make sure that the women of America and you and the men who care about women know that the latest Republican shutdown plan continues their war on women. Shutting down the government is a dangerous game and the Republicans are playing it. And in that game, there are no winners and there are only losers. Republicans are obsessed with stopping the Affordable Care Act. But let's be clear, a government shutdown does not stop the Affordable Care Act. Starting tomorrow, millions of Americans will sign up for affordable health insurance, and there's nothing the Republicans can do uh, to stop it. So all of this feudal brinksmanship brings only chaos, brings only pain, with hundreds of thousands of workers not providing the services that people need, bringing a self-inflicted blow to our economy, which will hurt every single American. Let's look at what else the latest Republican shutdown proposal entails, in addition to their efforts to stop the Affordable Care Act, which, as I said, they can't do. They want to repeal the medical device tax, which raises $30 billion over 10 years. So whether you're for that tax or against it, they don't replace the revenues. So their continuing resolution, their shutdown plan, causes a $30 billion increase in the deficit over 10 years. The Republican shutdown plan is a budget buster. But now they've added a new target, the Republicans have, a group that they frequently punish, a group called women. They keep follow this. They keep all other benefits of Obamacare that have gone into effect already, every one of them, and we've gone through them. If you're a young person, you can stay on your mom and dad's insurance. If you're a child and there's a pre-existing condition, they can't stop you, and so on and so forth. But they do single out only one existing benefit to stop, and that benefit is known as the Women's Health Amendment. Now, I'm going to show you this, and we have it for you if you're interested afterwards. But here is the section that they delay. The only existing benefit that they stop. And here's, here's what it says, the first four words. With respect to women. And we have that for you to look at. It talks about the preventive care that will no longer be available if they have their way. And I want to tell you what those benefits are that they're stopping. Guaranteed affordable birth control, screenings for cervical cancer, screenings 
for sexually transmitted diseases, or STDs. Screenings for pregnancy-related diabetes. Screenings for domestic violence and breastfeeding counseling and supplies. Anyone, any of you, any of us, who have ever lost a loved one knows the critical importance of these preventive services. Those very services Republicans want to stop in their shutdown proposal. Anyone who has ever postponed a life-saving cancer screening because they couldn't afford it knows how cruel and dangerous this Republican shutdown plan is. And here's the thing. Republicans already lost a vote on this very provision in the United States Senate, and they already lost an election in part because voters rejected their war on women. But still, their war on women continues. They cannot seem to stop themselves. So we will stop them. Make no mistake about it. We say to them today, stop this war on women of America. Stop these self-inflicted wounds on our economy and our deficit. Take up and pass a clean CR. Pass a clean debt ceiling. These are our most basic responsibilities. And it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Senator Stabenow. I'm going to push this away for you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Boxer. It's a uh, pleasure to stand with Senator Boxer, Senator Hirono, on behalf of the Democratic women of the Senate to make it very clear. Just as they tried to shut down the government in 2011 by, by saying they wanted to stop preventative health care for women, they are doing it again, and we will not let it happen this time as well. It's appalling to me. When we look at the majority of Americans who are women, 150 million women who have already been benefiting by preventative health care being available without out-of-pocket costs, no longer the insurance company is able to discriminate against women just because we are women and calling that a pre-existing condition. And when we look at the fact that come January, there are over 8 million women who for the first time are going to know that if they are pregnant, they are going to be able to have maternity care, prenatal care, to be able to give them the very best chance to have a healthy baby and be able to take care of them. Without the Affordable Care Act, maternity care will be unavailable for the majority of women trying to find health insurance on their own in the private market. That's just a fact. And as many of you know, you were with us last week when we heard from some young moms who had gone through that situation. But to add insult to injury, as Senator Boxer said, not only are they stopping or delaying in their minds the ability for women to get the comprehensive health care they need, including maternity care, but they have to go a step further mm -hmm. and say, you know, for the, the health care coverage you're already getting, right. not preventative services for men, only preventative services for women, will be eliminated through this provision. Right. This is stunning, absolutely stunning, and we are committed on behalf of the women of this country to make sure that this does not happen. It will not happen. It's time to continue funding the government. And let me just say one other thing. We're talking about a debate over a continuing resolution for six weeks. Six weeks. Rather than coming together, Republicans and Democrats, House and the Senate, to be able to continue important services jobs for men and women, paychecks for our military, support for veterans, support for seniors, support for children and families for six weeks. They are choosing to want to delay health care for women in this country and stop the most basic preventative care that's already in place for women in this country. Not going to happen. <clears throat> Great Senator from Hawaii. Thank you. I'm glad to join my colleagues uh, and the rest of you this morning. This incessant and uh, seemingly irrational 
continuing attack on the Affordable Care Act uh, it truly defies all logic. So here we are on the eve of a government shutdown, and rather than going forward and doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is to keep government running, uh, the Republicans have used every single opportunity to put in various provisions that would defund the Affordable Care Act. This isn't the first time in the House they have tried to repeal the Affordable Care Act dozens of times. And when I was in the House, I voted against every single one of those efforts. Forty-three. Forty-three. Dozens. So, uh, one, <laughs> so there's uh, somebody who said if you keep uh, doing the same thing you, you, and you're going to get the same results, so it's time to take another tack. But apparently the Republicans have not gotten that message yet. And so here we are in the dead of night while the rest of we, most of us were sleeping, except for those of us who continue to be watching what the House was doing. At midnight or some dead of night, they snuck in. A provision one more time that specifically targets women of this country. It's just amazing. We already have laws in this country that prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex, race, race um, religion, and yet they put in this provision that just targets the women in this country. It truly defies logic. And my colleagues have already uh, talked about what they're doing is preventive care for women where the women do not have to pay copay. Mm -hmm. So it especially, you know, hits, hits women in a way that is totally unjustified, unfair. And I say to everyone in this country who cares about fair treatment of everyone, stop doing this. Let's move forward. Let us pass legislation that's going to keep government going, that's going to raise the debt ceiling, and then we can have a rational, reasoned debate. Yes, we have a lot of differences on these other issues. Stop targeting women for these kinds of specific <coughs> attacks. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yes. A question for all of you on the larger issue of the shutdown. Uh, as you know, if, if a shutdown can't be avoided, members of Congress like yourself <coughs> will continue to collect a paycheck. You'll still get paid. Uh, is that appropriate? No. I have a bill, S-55. It would stop us from getting paid if we didn't continue the government and if we didn't pay our bills and we defaulted. I ask everyone to become a co-sponsor of that bill. We passed it once before. We sent it over to the House. The last time they played these games, the House killed it. So it's absolutely inappropriate. We should be treated the same as everyone. And I think I speak for my colleagues on as that. As a co-sponsor. Yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the medical device tax and that right. there is support for doing something on that. Um, is there, can you give any idea of what the, what, what the caucus might consider as an appropriate to pay for if, you, if they were to uh, repeal I, that? I, I want to say this. We are having a caucus <coughs> meeting, but I don't want to confuse things with you. Senator Reid, as recently as five minutes ago, said that we're going to handle this message from the House the same way we handled their first bill. And that is we're going to strip anything extraneous from it and send them back a clean CR. That means they have two clean CRs over there. That's what they're going to have. Getting into the details of what we could talk about on some other playing field, as was suggested, we have to do our work, and there's lots of issues we could take up, including the medical device tax. But I want to just speak personally about this. For a Republican Party that is haranguing the Democrats about the deficit, they ought to wake up and smell the roses. The deficit has gone down by 50 percent under this president. The last time we had a surplus was when Democrats were in control. And now this just shows you know, how, how hypocritical they can be by putting a repeal of a tax in there and not replacing the revenues. And so this shutdown plan of theirs adds $30 billion to the deficit over 10 years. And they should be ashamed of themselves. In this version, they add $30 billion to the deficit. We could argue the medical device tax, believe me. And a lot of people really want to get rid of it, trust me. But it has nothing to do with this particular situation that we're in now, which is that we don't want to add to the deficit. We just want to keep the government running. And 
I, I don't know if anyone else has another well, take I would, on it. I would just um, agree with Senator Boxer and indicate again, this is a six-week CR. Now, as somebody uh, who's been very involved in the whole effort around medical devices, in fact, we cut in half in the final bill the original right. uh, tax for uh, medical devices. Uh, there are other opportunities and ways for us to move forward and uh, be able to continue to improve on health reform. That is not what this is about. I mean, this is about six weeks of supporting our troops, our veterans, our seniors, our children, our families, the economy. Six weeks. And we need to just come together, make that commitment to continue uh, public services for the next six weeks without people losing paychecks and being harmed. And then as we go forward, we'll have a number of opportunities where we can talk about ways to work together. Senator Sano, can you address what this really means for people in Michigan? You kind of alluded to a few things, but specifically, what should people expect? Well, there are many, many ways in which this uh, affects people in Michigan, whether we're talking about someone who just uh, turned 65, wants to sign up for Medicare, for instance, uh, where they won't have the ability to uh, go in and, and sign up. Uh, we see potential threats of veterans' payments and disability payments. Uh, we potentially, in Michigan, as a uh, contractor for a lot of defense work around suppliers and manufacturers. We don't know how it will affect payments to our small businesses. Uh, we will see uh, the uh, potential payments going out uh, around farm programs uh, for farmers or around food programs. I mean, it's very unclear because the administrative structure will be closed, even though some things will continue, like Social Security payments and so on. But if you are newly retired mm -hmm. and want to be signing up, uh, you won't have the opportunity to do that. If you are going on travel with your family, the ability to get a passport, something as, as simple as that, will not be available. So from uh, payments for small businesses to the regular functions of government to those that are signing up for uh, health care, veterans benefits, and so on, uh, everyone will be impacted in some way. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add that every state has federal programs and federal employees, and so all of these programs and employees w will be affected. There are um, people spending, having spent hours and hours figuring out uh, what they're going to do to keep essential services going, essential employees doing those services already in preparation for a shutdown. So let's just remember, every single state has federal employees. And of course, in the state of Hawaii, where we have a large military presence, they are going to be affected. Yeah, I would, I would just say, to add to everything that's been said, coming from a border state, we have special problems there. Uh, we also have some magnificent parks uh, that people plan for years and years to bring their families, uh, only to find out if we have a shutdown, they can't enjoy those places. We have all kinds of Superfund toxic waste sites that need to be cleaned up from former defense installations. Uh, people live near those sites, children live near those sites. There's just no end of hurt. And uh, the longer it goes on, the worse it is. So we're here to say to the House, and, and I, you know, having served in the House, I know mm -hmm. we all did, mm -hmm. I was there for 10 years. I had the joy of being there when Tip O'Neill was the Speaker. And I want to tell you about how it was then. Uh, Tip O'Neill had a certain magic. And the magic was the number 218. Mm -hmm. And he knew that he was not going to get every Democrat, or maybe he wouldn't even get a block of Democrats on everything he did. So he'd come over and he'd say, he'd say, uh, Barbara, could you be with me on this particular vote? Gee, Mr. Speaker, it's not good for my state. I don't really, I don't think, I don't. Keep your powder dry. Okay, okay but we've got to move this bill. You know that. Lots count. I do know that, Mr. Speaker. Then he'd go and find his votes. He'd come back. He'd say, you know, we're okay. If, you know, you need to vote your district. I understand it. That, that's what a speaker is supposed to do. They're not a speaker of the Democrats or a speaker of the Republicans. They're speaker of the House. And if John Boehner would take our bill, we're going to now have a second one, clean, and just put it on the floor, like he finally did with the Violence Against Women Act, mm -hmm. which he could not get done with just his members, we would not be here now. 
we would be fine. So I have that message to John Boehner. Uh, act like a Speaker of the House, not just like a Speaker of the Republicans, and pass my bill. So your people don't get paid. You'd be surprised how fast they'll come to the table. Well, and speaking of yeah. being paid. Yeah, and we'll go to you next. Senator Boxer, and for the three of you, the, the, just the logistics of how this day is going to run. Uh, at some point this afternoon, the, the Senate's going to reject what the House sent over. If the House sends over something else, will you keep voting throughout the night? Let me, let me just speak after having discussed this with the leader's office. And I'm just, the, the other questions you'll have to direct to Senator Reid. Senator Reid will be on the floor around 2 o'clock. Mm -hmm. He is going to announce what we're doing. We're not just going to reject. We're going to strip out the amendments that are extraneous, that attack women, that, you know, bust the budget, that have a futile delay in Obamacare. And we will send back right. a CR. And by the way, it's the numbers they want. So don't just say reject. We are taking their numbers. We're not happy mm -hmm. about that. We're willing to compromise and take their numbers for the six-week period. We want it clean. So that's what we'll do. As far as what Boehner does at that point, he'll have two clean CRs in front of him. And then he has to decide. But I, I'm, I'm not at liberty to say what Senator Reid will do if and and what and how. I can just tell you what we plan on doing this afternoon, which is to strip those amendments <coughs> from the message. It's a message from the House and send it back. That will give them two vehicles that they can now put on the floor. Let me just yes, underscore Betty. one thing that Senator Voxer said and that is what we will send back is already a compromise. It continues cuts mm -hmm. to small businesses in the defense industry and, and the sequester in defense at the, at the lower level. It continues cuts uh, in education, the National Institute of Health, it continues cuts in every part of the budget that frankly we want to fix and replace to be able to restore, restore critical investments. But we are willing to compromise for a six week period and give the House the funding number that they want. So that is a compromise. What we're not willing to do is stop hundreds of millions of Americans from being able to get, I should say, tens of millions of Americans from being able to get health care, maybe for the anyway. first time for you their families. You can't stop them anyway. Uh, okay. We have time for two more questions. Yes. Um, the House is considering sending back a bill that would have the so-called Vitter Amendment, which would, sh which would eliminate subsidies for the purchase of health care on the, on the uh, exchanges for oh, I'm glad members you of Congress that. and for I'm their staff. I'm glad you raised that. And I want to know, they think that this is going to split the Democrats. They think that the Senate can't turn okay. it down. Let me, let me make something really clear right now. No United States Senator is forced in any way from taking a large employer contribution to their health care. Senator Vitter today, yesterday, and several years ago could have said, I don't want this employer benefit and could have sent the check back to the Treasury. He could also call in his staff and say, I've been thinking about it. I don't think you deserve to have an employer contribution for your health care. Therefore, your pay will now be reduced to equal the size of your contribution and I am sending it back to the Treasury. This is something that can be done right now. You don't need legislation to do it. So I say to all my colleagues who feel that they don't deserve to have an employer contribution, give it back. And if you don't think your uh, employees deserve it, cut their salary and send it back. Last question. If there's a government shutdown, will you all forego your pay and will you be sending some of your staffers home without pay? Well, nobody gets paid in a shutdown except members of Congress. So I am pushing my bill uh, to make sure that we do not get paid and that we are treated just like our staff. They don't get paid either. Thank you very much. Can you say you pay or you thought of what you do with your No, I want to pass my bill. And I'll probably give it away to a lot of good and deserving people. But that's not the way it should be. The, people, the way it should be is the people who are forcing this shutdown should go on my bill. And John Boehner shouldn't crush my bill like he did two years ago. That's how it should be. Not a few of us saying, well, we, we feel compassionate, so we're going to make some contributions.
what ought to happen is, what ought to happen is, he ought to say, if he's going to force pain on everyone else, he ought to take the pain. He and his members, really. And back here on the floor of the Senate, in a bit of a holding pattern here, most of the action right now going on in the House, which has gotten more than the 217 votes needed to move forward on an amendment they've been working on today. You can watch the action there on our companion network, C-SPAN, the House getting an amendment going to delay the individual mandate for the health care law and do away with subsidies for members of Congress and their staff. Those two changes are combined into one amendment that would be attached to a funding bill. And of course that delay of the individual mandate, something that the Senate has been saying all day it would not accept. After the vote in the House expecting debate for about 40 minutes there and then later tonight another series of votes for them to move forward on that government funding bill. While they're in a quorum call here on the floor of the Senate waiting for senators to come to speak, we're going to take a look at some of what Republican David Vitter, Louisiana, talked about earlier. He talked about part of the new House amendment, the portion dealing with subsidies for Congress and their staff, as well as uh, employees of the White House administration. And here he is from earlier today. Good to see you. Yep. Yeah, please. Please. Come here. Grover. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Ron DeSantis of Florida and I uh, welcome all of our colleagues and friends and outside groups who are here and all of you. We're here again to state strongly and clearly that we believe rule one of democracy, including this Obamacare debate, should be that Washington is treated like the rest of America and doesn't have special exemptions, special bailouts, special subsidies. And that's why we're continuing to fight hard for our no Washington exemption language to make sure that that happens under Obamacare. Washington is treated like the rest of America. No special exemption, no special subsidy, bailout, or sweetheart deal. I uh, really want to thank all of my colleagues here and all of our allies and outside groups for their strong, strong support, which has been advancing this cause for the last several weeks, I think, very, very effectively. And I'm very excited about where we're going toward the finish line. And with that, let me introduce the leader in the House for this legislation, great ally and friend, Ron DeSantis of Florida. Well, thanks, Senator. Th thank you all for coming. Um, 
you know, after the health care law was passed in 2010, there was an article in the New York Times and the reporter Robert Pear referenced how Congress was being treated by Obamacare. And he said, you know, if they didn't understand what they were doing to their own health care, how could they possibly know what they were doing for health care for the rest of the country? And I think this OPM decision, uh, a lot of members of Congress uh, wanted to get out of the law that they had passed, uh, but there's no easy way out. And we don't think the OPM law is, is legally sustainable, um, and we think that we need to take legislative action to correct that and simply go back to what the law actually says, and that is members of Congress are put into exchanges and they are not given um, any type of tax-free subsidy uh, under the law. Uh, I think that we're going to be actually voting on this today from, from what we were told at our, at our conference, uh, and I think that'll be a tough vote for a lot of people. Because when I campaign, I'm a first termer. I had people come up to me and say, "You guys up there, you just—they just take care of themselves. They don't really worry uh, about us." And so you look at some of the negative effects of Obamacare. You got people losing hours, getting pushed to 29 hours a week. Some businesses are not expanding, less hiring being done. Nobody's talking about relief for those people. But yet, when this pinches Congress, they all of a sudden are able to engineer a special rule through the bureaucracy. Uh, we should be the last ones who are getting relief. Our constituents should be the first ones. And so I look forward to today's vote. And I thank the senators here uh, who have been uh, very vocal and strong on this. Um, and I'd like to see um, how this will, will uh, shake out once it gets to the upper chamber. Absolutely. Great. And next is a leader on this issue from the very beginning during the Obamacare debate. He fought hard for this language, uh, Senator Mike Enzi of Wyoming. Thank you, and, and thank you for bringing this up, too. Uh, yes, I was on the Health Committee when it came through the Senate. We got this amendment on there that said whatever pain America is going to feel, the Senate and their staff are going to feel, the members of Congress and their staff are going to feel. And I was on the Finance Committee when Chuck Grassley brought it up there, and we passed it. Nobody can vote against that. They know that they, had, they ought to be under the same laws as everybody else in America. Unfortunately, during the recess, the president asked uh, that there be an exception there, that we be allowed to be different than the American people, that we be allowed to bring any subsidy from Congress with us. That's wrong. The amendment that we're trying to get through would prohibit that. It would make us be under the same law as America. And everywhere I go, the people say, it's about time. It's about time that Congress was the same as us. And one of the things it'll do is point out to Congress some of the pain that we're inflicting on this country with a law where they're going to have to disclose a lot of personal information for which there is no, no protection on privacy that they can certify. And uh, we're only in this position because we haven't done, a, a, done the appropriations bills the way we're supposed to. If that would have been done, this would have come up under Health and Human Services and it would have been fixed. So we're trying every step that we can to fix it so that Congress has to live under the same laws as everybody else. And, of course, we thought it might be a good idea to include the president and the vice president and the appointees of the president. They ought to feel the same pain as America. And uh, I can't believe that the president wouldn't want to be under a bill that has his name on it. Thank you, Mike. And another great leader in the center on this issue, been very, very involved from the beginning uh, of this uh, uh, fight, Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin. Thank you. I, I would first like to just thank uh, Senator Vitter and Congressman DeSantis and, and Senator Enzi for their leadership on this issue. I mean, this really is just a basic point that Congress should live by the laws that it passes. And I wasn't here during the health care debate. I, I watched it from afar. And it was, you know, when, when I look at the legislative history, it is the clear intent of Congress when they pass this law that apparently the subsidies are going to be so great that by pretty much a unanimous uh, consent in a committee that they thought Congress should have to actually purchase their health care through the, through the exchanges without subsidies. That was very clear intent. You know, the fact of the matter is, that there will be millions of Americans that lose their health care because of Obamacare. Members of Congress and their staff are part of that population. But because President Obama, without the legal authority, directed his agency to carve out a little special treatment for members of Congress and their staff, that is simply wrong because under that ruling, it will only be members of Congress and their staff that will have their employer be able to contribute 
toward that health care coverage in the exchanges regardless, regardless of their income level. Now, that is simply not fair. And, of course, President Obama is all about fairness. So, again, I, I just really applaud Senator Vitter, Senator Enzi, Congressman DeSantis for leading on this issue to make sure that Congress and their staffs must live by the laws that it passes. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. We have a wide spectrum of citizens groups who have been very, very involved in this effort, and they are the main reason we are advancing this ball, I think, very effectively. And we have three representing the broad, broader coalition here today. First, uh, Grover Norquist of Americans for Tax Reform. Obamacare, we're told, is a good idea, but they have to make it mandatory. Obamacare, we're told, is a good idea, but Washington wants itself exempted from it. We've seen the president give exemptions and delays to organized labor, to big business, to the large insurance companies, uh, and now through OPM to official Washington. We need to say that Washington should live by the same rules as the rest of the country in Obamacare and in other things. This legislation and the leadership by the members here is very important, and I think if the American people focus on this, this is one of the things that even Harry Reid's Senate is going to have to agree to. Thank you. Thank you, Grover. And next, in terms of active citizens groups, we have with us today Phil Kirpin of American Commitment. Thank you, Senator, and thank all of you for your leadership on this. In just the past two weeks, our activists sent over 26,000 letters to the Senate while Senator Vitter was holding the floor uh, trying to force an amendment on this. So there is an explosion of grassroots interest in this particular issue, and there ought to be. Frankly, what we saw on the floor of the United States Senate today was absolutely shameful. We saw Harry Reid and every single Democrat say they are willing to shut down the government to ensure that only the privileged few have delays, that only the privileged few are protected from the ravages of this law, and in particular, the largest 1% of corporations that are protected from the employer mandate while the individual mandate hits every American and small business. The least the Senate could do at this point in time is themselves live under the law that they passed. And let there be no mistake, the law as written is absolutely clear that they should be in the exchanges with no special subsidies. Their employers dropped their employer coverage. Their employers are the American people, and during the debate on Obamacare, it was crystal clear that the American people intended that they lose their existing employer coverage and instead live in the exchanges on the exact same terms as every other American losing their employer coverage. That has been illegally stopped by an OPM rule that disregards the clear language, structure, and intent of the law. That rule is wrong, and again, the very least... Senator Harry Reid can do if he refuses to grant individuals the same delay that special interests have is live under the law as written himself. So we're very proud to support this effort, and we would love to see the House included on the next iteration of the continuing resolution. Oh. And dare have the House oh, adopt. Senator, we're in a quorum call. Thank you very much. Uh, I ask that the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. Madam President, moments ago, the House of Representatives adopted a rule that indicates clearly that it is set to adopt a resolution containing unrelated conditions that will forestall its approval by this chamber. That is a tragic result that threatens harm and havoc to countless people who depend on government programs and to our economy. It threatens harm to veterans and troops, children who depend on Head Start, seniors who receive meals, and it threatens jobs and economic growth with a ripple effect that will set all of us back in the continuing fragile and all too slow recovery that we've seen from the greatest recession in recent memory. Today's result in the House of Representatives is a tragedy for democracy. Without any overstatement, we have to recognize that this result reflects a dysfunction in democracy. The threatened shutdown in our government is the result of an extreme ideological fringe element in one house and one party 
that has made the decision that their agenda is a take it or leave it condition. That it's more important than economic growth, more important than our seniors and our children, our veterans and our troops who will be impacted very directly by this impending shutdown. That it's more important not only than the key services, but also to our economic growth and jobs. This morning I gathered in Glastonbury, Connecticut with a group of manufacturers, their employees, and economic experts. One economic expert in particular, Stephen Lanza of the University of Connecticut, who told us that a shutdown of three to four weeks would cost the state of Connecticut alone 2,000 jobs. We know from predictions of expert economists like Mark Zandri of Moody's Analytics that the result for the country as a whole could be percentage points in lost growth. In fact, we can ill afford this self-inflicted, manufactured wound to our nation and to the trust and confidence that people deserve to have in our democracy and our economy. For some businesses, these problems will be more than acute. They will be life-threatening because their existence, not to mention their profits, depends on consumer demand that will be diminished by the ripple effect and the ramifications of the 9,000 federal employees in Connecticut who will be furloughed and the hundreds of others whose jobs will be threatened by a shutdown of just days or a week. The fact of the matter is we can't know at this point what the full economic ramifications will be. There are more questions, serious questions, than there are answers. I will support an amendment and a measure that will be offered, I think, later this evening or within hours to preserve the benefits and payments that are due to our veterans for their service and sacrifice. That is a provision that we need to make. It's our responsibility to keep faith with those veterans and make sure that we leave no veteran behind and that the processing of claims goes forward and that our veterans receive the benefits that they have earned. At the forum that I had this morning, Brian Montanari, the president of HABCO in Glastonbury, told us he relies on contracts of the federal government for much of his business and his employees, whose ranks he has been uh, adding will be impacted by this potential shutdown, if only the uncertainty that it creates. And he is not alone. Businesses all over Connecticut and all over the country will face a tougher economic climate because of this shutdown. The Small Business Administration will stop processing applications for the business loans that it provides for tens of thousands of entrepreneurs, risk takers, and job creators around the country. And Perhaps the most galling aspect of this shutdown is the direct economic hardship it will cause to families whose jobs will be threatened, whose livelihoods will be at risk. I'd like to say there's still time, and there is. There are hours to go before the final hour. But the point here is, as the President said so well earlier, keeping the government open is not a bargaining chip, it's our job. As Pres President Obama said, you don't get to extract a ransom for doing your job. Families need to be able to plan for their future, businesses need the certainty to make investments and hire new workers, and the nation needs both parties, not just one, to be fully committed to the democratic process. I hope in the time remaining that the House does its job that these extremist demands are rejected, and certainly by this chamber they will be. My hope is that we can move forward, keep the government open, and providing services that people need, and 
the support for the economy that is all too necessary at this point in our history. Madam President, I thank you and I yield the floor. Suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. back in a quorum call here on the floor of the Senate. And again, in a bit of a holding pattern here, a number of speeches going on right now, about 40 minutes of debate on the floor of the House as they move forward on a new amendment that's going to be attached to the continuing resolution that they'll then have to send back here to the Senate. That new amendment includes a one-year delay in the individual mandate of the health care law, as well as um, doing away with the subsidies for health care that would have gone to Congress, their staff, and administration employees. We're gonna, and, and so we're going to wait here, see if anybody else comes to the Senate floor, and uh, see as, as things progress throughout the night here. There is a expected to be a vote sometime later tonight, maybe around 9 p.m. Eastern Time, over on the floor of the House. And you can check in on the House on our companion network, C-SPAN. And while we're in a quorum call here on the Senate floor, we're going to take a look back at some of what happened earlier today. The Senate Democratic leaders, after they took a vote today rejecting the House measure from earlier, take a look at what they had to say. The House has had our bill since Friday. They've still got it. Their amendments, their uh, vexatious amendments are gone. They're no longer part of what we're doing here. As we said Friday, nothing's changed. They try to send us something back, they're spinning their wheels. We are not going to change Obamacare. If they want any changes in Obamacare, wait till after the debt ceiling. Wait until they're willing to sit down and do a budget for us, with us, and uh, approach this in a reasonable manner. I have a very simple message to John Boehner. Let the House vote. Stop trying to force 
a government shutdown. Let the House work its will, all 435 members, not just the majority. If they brought this bill to the floor with a rule that said everyone could vote on it, it would pass by a large margin. It would prevent a government shutdown. If John Boehner blocks this, he will be forcing a government shutdown, and it will be a Republican government shutdown. That's pure and simple. Many House Republicans have admitted openly that this is a fool's errand. Dent from Pennsylvania said it's a fool's errand. He said yesterday, let's vote tomorrow. I'll vote for it to keep the government open. And other House members have said the same thing. The votes are there to pass a clean CR. Here's what Dent said specifically. I'm prepared to vote for a clean resolution tomorrow. It's time to govern. I don't intend to support a fool's errand. That's a direct quote. Democrats have already met Republicans in the middle on spending. We're not going to be negotiating with ourselves, and that's what it amounts to. I've heard the idea of a short-term extension floated. Let me be very, very clear. The Senate's bill is a short-term extension. That's what it is. This is a six-week funding bill. That's all it is, six weeks. We can't pass this. We're only truly entering a banana Republican mindset. This is what we look at other countries doing. The United States, we're going to be funding the government for a week, 10 days at a time, not so good. The bottom line then is this. House Republicans face the same issue they faced yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before. Let the Senate's clean PR pass. I'm sorry, the, the Senate's clean PR pass. Oh, there we go again. I got it. I got it. I got it. Let a clean CR pass. And it'll do it with bipartisan support or there's going to be a shutdown of the government caused by them, the Republicans. Really, without being too dramatic about this, the fate of the country depends on the House being able to vote. The House, all members of the House representatives. I hope that John Boehner makes a responsible decision, one that's good for the country. Job protection time is over with. It's time to start protecting the American people. Senator Durbin. Before the final roll call was announced on the floor of the Senate just moments ago, there was a memo uh, circulating, an email circulating, that the Republicans in the House anticipated losing and now wanted to tell us what the next stage of this drama would be. Or well, they're going to send it back to us now with some new versions of the amendment. Some sort of delay or defunding of Obamacare and something to do with members' health care. You see where this is headed? And staff. And you see where this is headed? They're going to keep playing this over and over and over again, expecting a different result. The result will be the passage of the clean CR that we sent them when they call it on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives. I watched over the weekend while some of the Tea Party Republicans were congratulating themselves on their wisdom and their courage. Their courage? What courage does it take for a Tea Party Republican to shut down the federal government? at the expense of someone else's job, at the expense of critical services that people across America count on every single day. That's not courage. That's cowardice. Let them step up and accept their responsibility to govern and let it start with the speaker. I understand his plight. It's very obvious to the world. He has a willful group within his caucus. One Republican House member said to me, we aren't dealing with two parties in the House, we're dealing with three. Two different Republican parties and a Democratic Party. And most of our caucuses, as he said, are a fight between the two versions and factions of the Republican Party. That's what he's up against. But I don't feel any sympathy for him at all at this moment. At some point, he has an awesome responsibility in the chain of succession to lead the United States of America as Speaker of the House to step up and lead in the name of the American people and for the good of our country to think 
that because of his willful faction of Tea Party Republicans, he would allow this government to shut down and continue to play these games back and forth is just inexcusable. Inexcusable for anyone who calls himself a leader. I hope the Speaker steps up. He owes it to the American people, not just federal employees, but to everyone who is praying that this economy gets stronger and we don't lose jobs over this folly. Well, in all my years in Washington, I've never seen anything like what the hard right Republicans are doing now. Their hostage taking tactics have left us less than 10 hours away from a government shutdown. It said four days the first day we came to the clock, three days the second, zero. No days. Nine hours, 17 minutes, 20 seconds. Now, some on the right have said, oh, this always happens. They say people always compromise and make deals to keep the government running. They say, oh, we've had shutdowns before. It's true. There have been shutdowns before, but it wasn't like this one. It was never the intent, the stated intent and actual intent of one side to shut down the government if they didn't get their way. There were disagreements on extraneous issues like abortion, and the clock ran out of time, and they had to fund the government. But it wasn't the intent of one side or the other saying, unless I get my way on abortion, I'm shutting down the government. Never before, never before in our history has one party threatened a government shutdown if they don't get 100% of what they want on an issue totally unrelated to the budget. The best analogy I can think of Let's say Nancy Pelosi, during the TARP debate, when the world economy was teetering on the edge of a cliff and George Bush was president and needed the vote, said she wouldn't pass TARP unless Republicans rolled back all the Bush tax cuts. The analogy is exactly the same. The danger is real. What they're asking is the number one priority of the first Obama administration, just like the Bush tax cuts were of their administration. So it would be like a group of members. If we gave in to this, next, what about a group of rural members saying we're going to shut down the government unless we get the farm bill just as we like? What, a, what about a group of civil libertarians saying we'll shut down the government unless NSA stops at the metadata program? It could go on and on. It would be absurd and it would be unprecedented. Now, I heard a couple of Republicans say that they have, they're compromising by moving from defunding Obamacare to just delaying it a year. That's like saying we're compromising. Instead of cutting both your arms off, we'll only cut one off. Aren't we great? Never before has one side, either Democrats or Republicans, made such extreme demands. Now, the funny thing is, Speaker Boehner knows he won't succeed, but the hard right is demanding a pound of flesh to show how serious they are, how much they hate Obamacare. By going along with the hard right, Speaker Boehner is like the ancient Mayans, making a sacrificial offering to the right-wing gods by refusing to accept a clean CR but he's putting the economy, the paychecks of millions of Americans on the sacrificial altar as he shuts down the government. Rather than doing the right thing and abandoning the hard right, Speaker Boehner is holding out the forlorn hope that by sending us new demands day in and day out, Democrats will capitulate. He's wrong and we won't. And why not? Why? Well, just think about it. If we give an inch on the CR, they're going to take a mile on the debt ceiling. The hard right will say, see, they gave in. Let's demand more. And they'll do the same thing on the full-length CR in December. If you give in to these tactics on any particular issue, it encourages them to happen again and again and again and our economy is tied in one big knot, and our economy goes down, our, our, our government is tied in one big knot, and the economy goes down the drain. We won't be extorted now. We won't be extorted two weeks from now. We won't be extorted in December. Speaker Boehner, pass our bill.
Well, a lot of people are watching the House of Representatives right now, and they're asking the same things that all of us are. What are they thinking? And why would they hurt their own constituents simply to make a point? We are hours away from a completely unnecessary government shutdown that is going to hurt our families and our communities and threaten our fragile economic recovery. It doesn't have to happen. The path forward should not be difficult. The Senate has passed a very short-term bill that will keep the government open at the current spending levels with no changes in policy while we continue to work on a long-term budget deal. Now, I have spent six months working to get Republicans in a room to negotiate that budget deal and avoid this crisis. But at this moment, the absolute bare minimum that Congress should be able to do the very least that we owe our constituents is to not actively hurt them and sabotage our economy. And that is exactly what the House Republicans are doing by playing political games with this short-term spending bill. We in the Senate have made it very clear. We will not allow the Tea Party to take the government hostage to put the insurance companies back in charge of our health care system. It's just not going to happen. And families across the country, whether they support the health care law or not, are really getting sick and tired of the Tea Party pushing us from one crisis to the next to the next to fight a battle that's already over. I know Speaker Boehner is very concerned about what the Tea Party thinks of him, but I urge him to do the right thing. Put the Senate bill up for a vote in the House. Let it pass. And then join us at the table so we can work towards a longer term deal and end these constant crises. There's still time for the House to act to avoid this shutdown. We are hearing more and more from Republicans who agree with us that the only responsible path forward is a clean CR. I hope that Speaker Boehner is listening. Bring the Senate bill up and pass it. Yes. Um, sounds like the, the next shell for the Republicans is going to be a, a, a delay in the individual mandate and this litter language. Um, first, are you going to reject that as well? And have you yes. had any indication from the yes. speaker that that's going to be his last volley in this? I have not, no, no, maybe they'll try something else. But it'll, it'll. I don't know when it gets here, but it'll take however long it takes it to get over here. It'll take us long enough to vote. 20, 30 minutes. We'll get rid of that. We are not going to negotiate on this. We have done everything we can to be fair and reasonable. Senator Murray, in spite of, in spite of, they're ignoring her. In spite of ignoring Senator Mikulski, we why don't they take yes for an answer? We've got 988. Ours is 70 billion above that. The president has met with these folks all over town. The White House took them to dinner in different some of the fancy restaurants. He put in writing what he was willing to do. Put in writing. They have yet to issue a sentence after all those meals they've eaten not a sentence as to what they are willing to do, which is nothing. So our negotiation is over with, and I've said that for two weeks. They should pass the CR. They are closing down the government. I don't know what in the world is wrong with them, why they're fixated on this Obamacare. It is the law. Tomorrow the exchange in Nevada is up. We have 600,000 people in the sparsely populated state of Nevada that need health care. The, they can go in Nevada, they can buy a policy for $100 in Nevada. Damn sure can't do it now. With Obamacare, they can, starting tomorrow. Senator Reid, are you going to keep the Senate in session later tonight to dismiss the House's latest proposal? Sure, we're not going any place. Senator Reid, so do you feel like it's important to stand your ground on this particular argument? I'm sorry, say that again? Sorry, do you feel like it's important to stand your ground on this particular argument, knowing that the debt limit fight is coming up in the next few weeks? And All the more reason, just as Senator Schumer said. You know, with a bully, you cannot let them slap you around because they slap you around. Today, it's, they slap you five or six times. Tomorrow, it's seven or eight times. We are not going to be bullied. We have done everything we can, and we've done it very reasonably. We have a debt ceiling coming that this is horrible, what they're doing now. But this is, as, all, as the Business Roundtable said, the Chamber of Commerce said, the debt ceiling is cataclysmic. They are, they are playing with fire, and the American people know who's creating the fire. Senator Reid, do, do you have any 
Have you had any recent conversations with Speaker Boehner? I don't talk. I don't talk about my conversations.